Now, how do you build Ukraine back from rubble? Okay, and we have a professional engineer um, and a, I guess, a, a builder, a builder of better spaces and places for humanity. Manfred uh, Zapka, he'd been at the university for many, many years uh, with Phyllis Horner, and they have a company called, what is it, Better Places and Spaces. Um, and uh, we'll show we'll show the uh, the website name shortly. <clears throat> and I don't have to show you the graphics because I was I was thinking, gee, uh, let's let's show some graphics of the rubble. But everybody's seen all the, the rubble. We don't have to show you that. It's been embossed uh, on your mind and memory forever and ever. If you if you think of nothing from this point forward, think of Ukraine in rubble and death and destruction of every kind of. Uh, uh, infrastructure, every kind of building, every kind of residence, every kind of road, bridge, what have you. Uh, Mr. Putin is destroying the country right down to Brownfield. And it's a, a, the, the most tragic, outrageous thing we have seen. We thought we saw outrageous things during the Trump era. And this is far, far more outrageous. It's hard to describe how outrageous it is. It's, a, it's an insult to humanity, to the species. So Manfred joins us to talk about what you do at the end game. And uh, I just I want to quote a sign that I saw floating around the Internet, Manfred. <clears throat> this is a, a Ukrainian woman. It's got a big sign, big sign, uh, bigger than she is. And it says, um, if Putin stops um, the war, uh, there'll be no more war. If Ukraine stops the war, there'll be no more Ukraine. And so it's really interesting to think about that. But the likelihood is, just looking forward, is that there's so much devastation already that we have a major project in our hands, which will probably get worse in terms of Ukraine. Ukraine, a country that was of 44 million people, second largest country in Europe. Um, Ukraine, with, you know, which has uh, independent democracy. Um, Ukraine with a kindly people and Ukraine, which has been essentially destroyed. So Manfred, I give you the job. I make you the chief engineer of Ukraine, such as it will be soon. Where do you start to rebuild Ukraine and how far can you get and what can you give us as a finished product? Well, thank you so much for having me, Jay. It's really, uh, you called me up a couple of days ago and uh, you know, uh, everybody is under their impression right now. This is something which is beyond. We didn't we didn't think that actually this would be possible. You know, and uh, you know, how can you explain people like you know being shot at when you try to flee and all kinds of stuff? So it's really depressing. The end game actually. So what do we have? Actually, if Putin or Russia wins or whatever, they take over the whole country, or then actually they have to de decide. You know what's going on there. But it will not be over very soon, I think. This will be a long problem. And uh, I think, you know, Mr. Putin, you know, was taking a bite, probably which was too big. You know, it cannot be done in a couple of days. This will, might be 10, 20 years, actually, down the road. We'll see, actually, the, the consequences of that. So let's be, actually, you know, hopeful. And uh, let's be hopeful and say, what can we do with that mess? And uh, first of all, let, so that actually means somewhere the, the Ukrainians, they will actually still have a, uh, a country. They can decide for themselves. Because otherwise, you know, what Russia does is very hard to tell what they can. They also have a lot of problems and at their hand. And, uh, you know, I think the reason why they got in there, it's not like a spur of the moment. It has been brewing for a long time. So again, like let's step back a little bit and be hopeful and you know give also people hope in Ukraine. Because if you look back, you know, and if you look what Ukraine is, Ukraine is pretty darn poor. You know, if you for instance compare the GDP, you know, of let's say United States, what we take for granted, and we always say, hey, you know, everything is so expensive, and then we see Ukraine. And we actually, our uh, GDP is about $20 trillion. $20 trillion. And guess what Ukraine is? $115 billion. So their, uh, uh, their gross uh, uh, domestic product is about like 1% of what we have. 
the, like what you said, uh, J actually is like their, their uh, population is one tenth of what we have. So they are really doing not well. And they had a lot of problems and the problems reached back. And again, like I'm not a geopolitical <laughs> expert or whatever, although I'm very opinionated, but uh, on the other side, actually, you know, what can we do as from an engineering or in, in, uh, engineering or te technology standpoint to help? <clears throat> the first thing, of course, is like, you know, what, what, what are the problems? And one of the biggest problems uh, the Ukrainians have is energy. <clears throat> That's not a big surprise, right? Uh, the problem is that they are, uh, you know, uh, the country is very energy inefficient. If you, for instance, speak about energy efficiency, this means energy service relative to energy you have to invest. And energy doesn't mean like very complicated. If you want to achieve something with energy, just make a product or heat a house or whatever, the energy efficiency is about three times worse than in Poland, which is the neighbor, or 10 times worse than in Germany. So they have a big problem on their hand if they had you know, more energy, that's, that would only be part of the problem because they have to learn how to use it more efficiently. Yeah, and but, to add, it's cold. It, get co it gets cold in Ukraine. You need energy to stay warm and productive. That's true. And again, like, you know, uh, when you look actually at, you know, their, their uh, you know, primary and primary energy, energy, or let's say the energy which is used for, uh, you know, creating electricity, you know, over 50% of the energy right now is from nuclear, over 50%. Then we have about 40% of coal, you know, some renewables, and only 3% of natural gas. Natural gas is usually used for, you know, mostly for, for heating the houses, what you said, exactly, uh, uh, Ajay. And uh, their houses are very, very in inefficient. You know, there have been some... some uh, <clears throat> some efforts actually to bring in more energy efficiency because the, the, the European community actually, actually has sponsored, but also some Chin Chinese guys and so on, the, uh, private investors also, they try in and, and help them, but they really have to do some, you know, uh, major overhaul. So when we look, you know, what can we do to, re to get out of that, you know, rubble is we have to help them to rebuild and they should rebuild by doing it correctly. You know, mm -hmm. they actually, they, they see already the, the, the government of Ukraine actually has uh, <clears throat> signed the Paris, Paris Agreement. They also want to cut down on, on, on global, on carbon emissions. So they are on a good way, but they need help. Well, you suggest, um, just thinking of what you were saying, that they, they, need to, they need to build modern. They need to take the most current advice on how to deal with energy and uh, efficiency and so forth. Right. And, their, and their buildings up to this point have not been efficient. So it sounds like an opportunity, actually. It also yeah. sounds from what you say, Manfred, is that there'll be other countries that will want to help them. That is a geopolitical issue, but I think it's true. Um, and, and in fact, uh, other countries will, will give them money and loans. Other countries will give them expertise. Who knows, Manfred? Maybe they'll call upon you to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, you know, that's a good point. And, you know, when I was actually reading, you know, just uh, uh, in preparation, it came to mind that, you know, uh, Ukraine actually resembles the area where I was growing up. And that's in Germany. It's the Ruhr Valley. <clears throat> the, the Ruhr Valley was very much coal dependent. You know, that a lot of coal mines and, and all kinds of stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, downstream like the steel factories. So coal was the soul of, of, our, of our region there. And it's the same right now in Ukraine. They have a lot of coal mines, you know, that's, and uh, that's actually which provides a lot of employment. And most of these coal mines actually are really very inefficient. They should be shut down. And that's actually what the Ukraine you know, government wanted to do. But it's not that easy, of course, because you need coal in order to, to, to heat your houses, right? So I actually looked at you know, what our area, you know, this, the Ruhr Valley needed 40 years to get out of coal, 40 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, it will be similar to, to Ukraine, but we don't have that kind of time. And how it actually worked in, 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 the, in the region I came from, you know, the Ruhr Valley is, 
all of a sudden right now it's totally you know transformed there's uh, high technology there's renewable energies i can tell you afterwards if you have time for a project actually which might be a blueprint of what they're doing there so that actually is it's not necessarily how to to throw a new technology it's really societal transformation there and i hope actually you know and like you said although as dire it is maybe actually something good can, can come get out of it and you know we can actually help this you know the poor people there so what about those buildings you know i mean i i have the the pictures uh, before the bombing started showed us uh, charming streets uh, charming architecture uh, uh, charming cities in general lots of greenery um lots of you know socially acceptable public spaces and um how do you recreate that how do you create the buildings again they're you know they're what 17th 18th 19th century buildings um they have a charm um do you forget that and build something new i imagine in the ruhr valley as as through most of germany some very modern architecture um i don't know if you know martin de spang he's one of our hosts yeah. <laughs> And uh, he's into uh, avant-garde architecture, and I yeah. suggest that a lot of Europe is into avant-garde architecture. So, what do you do to recreate if you want to recreate those buildings right. um, to to re resurrect uh, the old and charming buildings that were in Ukraine? Well, I think right now this is a very good point, Jay, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that you brought it up. And but right now we actually have to look also at the situation for maybe for the next ten years. You know, there's a, the, the biggest population concentration was in the East, which right now is overrun. And it, it, it if actually, it might be that, you know, it stays the Donuts, Donuts area in the East, which actually also has, is the heart of the coal. They have the biggest, you know, deposits of hard, hard uh, coal there. It's a little bit in the, in the West, in the middle is all like brown coal. You can use it, but it's not that nice. Anyway, so I think that, and you see right now, two million people have fled. You know, they actually were in, are they going back? Are they coming more? So it's also in Europe's interest, Europe's interest just to, to you know, make the people comfortable so that they can actually stay in their, their country and, and build it up again. So how do you do this at the beginning, right? Because you have to provide housing, you know, over there. So can you do it in the same way actually as it used to be? Or, and, or, you know, because it takes a lot of time and effort. And I don't know if you can actually afford just to build it the same as it was. Or because, you know, in terms of smart cities, the, you know, if you have a concentrated and more high rise uh, architecture, it's more sustainable because it's more energy efficient rather than just making this urban sprawl, which we can see here in, in the United States, that actually is uh, not very sustainable. Mm, so they have to use the best planning they can possibly have. But one drill down question I want to ask you, and I've been thinking about it in anticipation of our discussion, is, um, you know, what do you do first? I mean, for example, um, OK, energy is important. So you have to plan the energy out. Maybe you have to build a, a solar farms. Um, you have to find a way to distribute the energy. It's a complicated plant. We know that from Hawaii, from everything that we, we see in energy in Hawaii. It, you can't do it overnight. Furthermore, you have to you know, get the electrical grid to reach to wherever there may be housing, high rise or sprawl. We have to have the power there. We have to have the water there. We have to have the sewage systems there. Um, what did I miss? Telecommunications, broadband, wireless. Uh, in order to have a reasonable middle class life, uh, all these things have to be put in. And the question I put to you is what is the sequence? Do you build it all in anticipation of the development or the redevelopment of the buildings? Um, or do you work it one step at a time? Can you work this one step at a time? Or is it necessary to, to do large infrastructure pro projects before you ever start rebuilding buildings? Well, that's a good question, actually. And again, like, you know, I might take a couple of minutes to, to answer it, right? <laughs> First of all, you need, of course, infrastructure. You need transportation because you have to, you know, put things around. You know, is that actually, you know, possible there? I mean, the, the railway system in, in Ukraine, in, the, in a sense, is better than ours. <laughs> and, uh, you know, public transportation is also has a very, you know, uh, big tra tradition over there. 
So they can actually can teach us more than you know we can teach them. In uh, by uh, uh, the in Ukraine, it's more an urban you know population. So not so much. So they actually used to to, to live in, in 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 cities. But what I think right now, and and that's an excellent point. How do we actually how do we you know approach it? Can we do it piecemeal or just you know just where actually do we start? And you know what we do have right now in the United States and in the in the Western or in the you know actually worldwide right now are really some good tools. And the good tools, you know, what they are called smart cities, smart uh, buildings, and also what they call digital twins. So a digital twin, for instance, lays out, you know, this is a digital representation of the physical object. And it started about 20 years back when, you know, digital twins were built mostly for aerospace. So, uh, for instance, usually you have to have, um, when you do a prototype of an of a, a, a airplane or so, you have to make models, physical models, all kinds of stuff. And it took about 10 years to make a new, like, a fighter or whatever. Right now they have, you know, cut this down to a year <clears throat> because of digital twins. And the digital twin afterwards or right now is already branching out into something else. And for instance, into construction that you can actually, you know, you can greatly, you know, uh, uh, increase the speed of construction. You can lower the cost, you can make things more green. And there's a digital twin also right now for entire, com for entire country. You know, Singapore right now came out and they dev developed the digital twin for, in for the entire country. The nice thing actually in this one is that, you know, a digital twin, think about like, I don't know if, if people will be familiar with a building information system that's actually, it assembles all the different uh, information of a building, right? We know that actually this is, this has been used for, you know, you know, a couple of years, 10 years or whatever, it's getting very popular. But a digital twin is a little bit different because the digital twin is actually taking signals. So from sensors, from information which come in and it can play out scenarios. It says actually what is best, what should we do in order, you know, to, for instance, uh, you know, increase energy efficiency, increase water efficiency, and actually like what is actually the, uh, the supply line for that. So what we actually can do, which, you know, is within our realm, at the beginning is just help them just to lay out what they have to do. I mean, some things have to be done. They have to build bridges in order to drive, you know, sources, they have to house people with dignity, but in order to build it up afterwards, because they also deserve a chance. I think that's actually also all. And, and you know, we should not give them only like stinger missiles. We can also, you know, hope and, and give them the tools that they can just, uh, you know, have a good life in the future. So we could do actually this. We can support them in this way. Yeah, we could make a model for all of Europe because you start with a, a, I want to call it a brown field. It isn't really a green field. <laughs> it's a brown field. Anyway, uh, you know, one thought strikes me, though, Manfred, is, um, uh, and, and actually this is being done in, in um, well, it's been done in various places, but including Russia, and that is printing houses printing houses. You've seen the, the, the devices, the equipment, and Excellent. you know that you can print a one family house, uh, you know, in, in this in less than 24 hours, all done. Um, well, maybe, maybe 48 hours, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> can you talk about that? Yes, actually, right now I'm com in communication of a, with a German company, and they just uh, printed the first multi-family house. And what it actually, the, the, the nice thing actually is that it, you can have, for instance, have a digital twin of a, of a house and uh, you can, for instance, uh, like you also have standards in, in Germany, which is called like passive house and passive house, you know, uses also passive things like how do you orient it or whatever. And it actually, in, in, you know, from experience, you have 80 to 90 percent of reduction in, en in energy because you don't heat and you don't cool. You don't have so, so these are possibilities. And then the uh, printing actually is a very good, mm, great thing because it also lays what they call a digi digital thread. This is the basic for a digital uh, digital model, and it comes like you know from a digital from a three D model of a house. So what you do is you 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 design your house in a three D. You know actually, in uh, this one is an analytic term 
you know where all the different uh, you know utilities are and so on and so you can actually have this in your model and then you print it the nice thing with printing actually you and there are different different technologies but you know when you see it's almost like putting door right now and and on a on a curved thing or whatever so in this thing actually it took about uh, not 24 hours to deliver it fast but about one a week actually to to build the the the, the walls and so on nice thing actually in this one is uh, again like you can have uh, you have you don't have to chop up the wall or whatever it's already in and uh, also one of the biggest thing is that you actually cut down on waste they say you know they can cut down 90% of the waste which comes down and they can use uh, you know indigenous or, or material from the region which is pretty cool so the, yes it is actually done and uh, i don't know right now they ha might have problem with a high rise also but it's a multi family multi multi uh, story house they did and they passed it through permitting and and it's already commissioned and people right now will be moving in so yes it is actually something which is very important and this one is i'm because happy you know this kind of really would would also help just to to do things fast <clears throat> because you don't in, in Ukraine, for instance, because the basic thing, they have to have shelter. They have to have a dignified way of just, you know, when they live mostly in the West or whatever, they have to, you know, get these things. So this is an excellent technology. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, you have bigger buildings. As you said, there are issues about doing printing for a, a high rise. So maybe you don't maybe you'd make it, uh, you know, just a few stories in, instead of a really high high rise. And then, of course, there's institutional buildings, government buildings. They've all been demolished, you know, um, right. and we, they have to rebuild them. So what, what would that technology work or would there be other methodologies that you would want to use for larger institutional public buildings? Yeah, actually, right now, this is a good one. It is not built here in Hawaii. And uh, because we just, from from uh, you know historical perspective, we build houses differently here. But again, like uh, one of the things is also what I think you already went into that, uh, uh, Jay. It's really a big shift right now in the construction industry. If you look at the last decades of like, you know, industrial output or whatever, you know, the, in, in the, the percentage of, of, of productivity was way, way, you know, it, it was increasing. And let's say, you know, the, <clears throat> of a certain industry, it's like 200% more uh, productivity in let's say two, 20 years, which is pretty big. The construction industry has always been behind. You know, they were always slow in, in embracing, you know, new technologies. <clears throat> and I was at a, at a uh, <clears throat> conference, it's called Boma International. And so once somebody said, hey, Manfred, that's pretty good, all the technology. The, the last uh, big innovation in, in real estate was the elevator. Right? So... <laughs> 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 Sounds but, right to me. <laughs> but that being said, you know, there's really incredible talent, you know, coming up. And the young, young uh, generation, they will embrace new technologies and it will absolutely, you know, uh, people right now, which I actually had the privilege of teaching at University of Hawaii at the School of Architecture, they know how to design 3D. If you have a 3D model, for instance, there are also what I really like, it's, it's called Utong. I don't know, it's a German word, but it's, it's a rated concrete. Aeration uh, 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 concrete is like nice for thermal thermal uh, insulation or whatever. And what you do is you almost have an erector set and they are numbered, you know, uh, pieces so they can be put together fairly, you know, fast. And, you know, you use actually you gluing things together. So maybe just like two and a half by four feet of, of blocks. And they fit all each in each other, they are, they are, they are built. This is another technology which is actually very popular, and another another technology which is also very popular in Germany and Europe is pre uh, prefabricated houses, because you know you can, for instance, under very good you know technology, very good conditions, you can prefabricate uh, you, you know all, all kinds of sections. You know you can tile better. You have electricity. You do it in in house. You are not hampered by by uh, by the elements and so on. And then you just has to be transported to site and erect. So sometimes like these, these houses come up in a, in a week, you know, which usually would take like half a year or nine months.
Was it practical to make it, say, uh, in a factory outside of uh, Ukraine and, and uh, truck it in? Or should it be done locally with local materials? I mean, I imagine you need a lot of concrete for all these things and query whether Ukraine has that or whether Ukraine needs to import it. Well, of course, right now it's almost that might be more effective, you know, that you just, you know, ship, you ship, uh, you know, uh, concrete or just raw materials over there. I mean, people also have to work there, you know, they also have to work a limit. And, you know, if you look at the edu educational system over there, it's pretty cool and impressive. I mean, similar to, 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 uh, uh, to Europe, uh, <clears throat> there is actually something which is called, you know, vocational training. So they are very good craftspeople and that kind of stuff, and they can build their own stuff. We just have to help them to, to get, uh, you know, get started. You know, I can see this uh, becoming um, a kind of center of building technology where people, including people from Hawaii, would go there and, and try to uh, contribute, participate, learn, teach, you know, um, have, have a of a, a kind of big collaboration with the Ukrainians. Um, it'll, and it'll be from the heart. It'll be right. altruistic, right. completely altruistic to help right. them rebuild the country at record speed mm -hmm. in a better way. But let me ask you about um, roads. Let me ask you about, um, you know, uh, wireless and, and telephone infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, wiring along the highways and all this. I mean, a lot of that has been destroyed. Right. Um, are there modern techniques for doing roads? Are there modern techniques for building telephone poles and the like? Uh, are there new technologies we should consider or they should consider in recreating their country? Well, I'm pretty sure, you know, what was really excellent in, in, in the United States, that's efficient building. You know, actually here we are in, in, in Las Vegas and, you know, the roads are amazing when they're building roads. I mean, they probably make it 10 times as fast as in, 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 in Hawaii, you know, although Hawaii has the problem with the, with the space. Well, there is, again, again, like there is a lot of things which we can offer them and they can do their own. I mean, the thing is like they are not dumb and they are willing, you know, they, you see right now they're, they're fighting so hard in order to keep their place, to keep their country. They don't want to be like, you know, servant of another master or whatever. They would like to be Ukrainians. And, but it's, you know, if you look at it, Jay, it will not be an easy, an easy effort. And it might take a while. Just take the example of German reunification. You know, right now uh, it cost $2.2 trillion in the last 20 years has been just transferred from the West to the East because they were similar, they were not destroyed East Germany, but it was similar, you know, backwards as in Ukraine. And it takes a lot of time. So it's like when Europe actually right now tries, hey, you know, uh, Ukraine come in, into our house or whatever, they also have a, a big responsibility to help them, you know, and, but again, like technology is there, you know, finances is there, our obligation to help, you know, our neighbors there is there and let's move ahead. I'm having an emotional reaction here. Um, this, this can be done. And it, hopefully not what it will be done. And it'll be a, a, at least a European effort, if not a global effort. Mm -hmm. And it will be the best that we can do when we collaborate, um, both on the, the work side, on the financing side, and on the actual construction side. Um, so it's uh, it's a very impressive possibility. Does it make you want to go there? Does it make you want to tell people they should go there? Uh, I'm not sure when, because right now may not be the best time. But you know, as and when it settles down, uh, it seems to me that a student of architecture, engineering, planning, what have you, spaces, you know, private and public spaces, uh, would would have no other better laboratory. Um, to to try his or her skills and to learn from others who are theirs with him or yeah I think that's a great idea I mean this is a beautiful country East Germany is like you know East East Europe they have very very beautiful and usually people are you know they are very friendly and open and they are not very they are not not rich like I told you right now they have like you know, a normal uh, monthly salary is about $300. So it's not like what we have, you know, so <laughs> it's totally different, but they have also beautiful, beautiful uh, landscapes and so on. And I think that's a very good, 
very great idea what you have. Like what we can do right now is we have technology, we have experience, we have talent, and we should also have a heart. And that's actually to reach out, not only again, like, you know, you're giving them weapons, but right now they have to defend themselves, but afterwards they have to come back. And uh, again, like it's always nice if you help your neighbor. Yeah, I hope I hope that I hope it works that way. Knock wood, you know, because we, we make this assumption in our discussion here that the Ukrainians will ultimately have their country back, uh, and you know, I, it's a whole different issue uh, if the Russians get the country. I mean, you know, it goes back to Stalin in, in 1933, where he he did he intentionally starved the people in Ukraine, and then shortly thereafter he brought in Russians to resettle it. And many of the uh, people in Ukraine are, you know, are descendant of, a, of those same Russians. But in the process, of course, he changed everything in Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine has been through a lot, and uh, therefore they are strong. Um, and this is part of their strength, I think. So the question I put to you, and this is a hard one, my last question, if you don't mind, Manfred, mm -hmm. suppose, suppose Putin takes over. Suppose he reduces it to rubble. Um, well, he's doing that now as we speak. As we speak, he's doing that. That's why I think they're going to send the Polish jets in right now, immediately, today. They, you know, 20 minutes from now, they're going to be flying. Anyway, <clears throat> suppose Putin wins and Putin has control, physical control of uh, this huge country. Um, I, would, uh, I would pity the people who are there, but um, query, what does he do? What can he do? What do you think he will do in terms of, um, you know, addressing the same issues that you and I have been talking about? Well, I think uh, Russia actually, by if you, their GDP is not that bad as Ukraine, but uh, their economy is mostly of just selling stuff they have in terms of like resources like oil, like gas and corn and so on. I mean, the thing is that it's, it's a backward country still. They should really develop it also to come forward. And we also have to see that, you know, they can also be like part of the global, global, uh, global population. I think what is really bad right now, what happens also, and there's a lot of people who are having good, good heart and so on also in Russia, that actually they will feel outcast, you know? So what can you do? I mean, this must be a terrible, terrible feeling what Putin does in terms of like what is over is like, you know, they usually also have a very, you know, backward energy efficiency in, in, in Russia because gas is, uh, gas is uh, abundant, you know, right now in the West, actually, we might wean ourselves more from his, so what does he do with his gas, you know? So he probably would go and also the Donets uh, where, where the, the Russian separatists actually have been taking over, that's also home of the coal. So I don't think that they will be investing a lot into the country because actually it was running right now in the East. There was the population centers. There was the center of heavy industry, also some technology. So he would be happy to have that and just to say, hey, you know, what happens to the West of Ukraine, it's not our, not our deal. So it wouldn't be a good outcome. Yeah. But again, like, you know, Russia is not only Putin, I think, you know, Putin will also only be there for, you know, so long. And, you know, we should also not forget that the best is actually to, there are also a lot of good people in, in Russia, I think. I don't know anybody, but I, I hope actually for the, for the world that it's like that. Knock wood. One, one uh, variation on that question, on that theme, I, I, uh, I think I need to ask you, and that's this. Suppose, suppose this is all for some reason, some geopolitical reason, some, mm, some war crimes reason, and not possible. And that uh, despite our vision, you and me, of how things could be uh, redeveloped in, in Ukraine, which has been reduced to rubble, nothing happens. It just doesn't happen, either by the Ukrainians who, in that case, in their case, would win, or the Russians. Nobody does anything. What happens, and I know you studied this because you're studying how architecture and engineering supports the human experience, life in, in a place, in a city, urban setting and the like. Suppose nobody does anything. There are still 40 million people there. Um, what happens to them? Can they live 
in rubble that has not been redeveloped. Um, what happens to the population? Again, like I'm not a politician or so. <laughs> I'm an engineer. I'm happy to be an engineer. It's always easier because, you know, you can count things. It has to be not 19. It has to be 19.256 or whatever. So that's the engineers. <clears throat> but uh, from our experience, there will be a lot of refugees, I think, because, you know, people do not want to live in the east of, the, uh, of Ukraine with the first thing actually, you know, he's taking over, he took over. And again, like 80% of the, the, the people in Ukraine, they consider themselves Ukrainians. And 20%, you know, they consider themselves Russian because they are only speaking Russian. And, you know, the, by history, the, the, the links were very, uh, very close. But what happens to the other one? They also want to have a life. So we see 2 million already came to Europe and there might be up to 10 million. I don't know, just, just, the, just the number. They have to be absorbed. And what happens, for instance, what we saw also for uni, uni, reunification of, of, uh, of Germany, a lot of million people came over to the West and uh, because they wanted to have a better life. So this will be a big strain also in Europe. And uh, what, what happens then? You know, like if, if, if there's no, no financial, uh, financial, uh, financial help for the people in Europe, in, in, in Ukraine, then uh, this will be a very meager life, I think. Yeah. But, you know, people are a resource. People help an economy. Maybe migrants don't help an economy immediately. The economy has to support them. But ultimately, they are, they are an asset, uh, assuming, you know, they're properly integrated into the economy and the society. Yeah. So maybe there's a benefit. On the other hand, I, what I hear you saying is that if there's no effort, no immediate effort to rebuild Ukraine, people will want to leave. You can't live in rubble. You can't live without these basic, you know, building, you know, elements of, of urban life. You can't live there. And so they will leave. And that will leave a, a shadow population, a, a se severely, maybe more than 10 million would leave. There's going to be nothing there for them at all to live. Right. Um, and, and that means Ukraine will be become a, Something out of 1933. Yeah. yeah. What actually was interesting, you know, was I was reading also while we are, you know, uh, in preparation here, and they actually the Ukrainians have done a lot in the last couple of years, and they, they they came with very limited resources. And one of the things I found very interesting was uh, in innovation centers. The innovation centers actually where they are located, and if you look at the map. Most of the innovation centers are, are located in the west of Ukraine, you know, so maybe that's something like, you know, we can, we can think that, you know, if it comes to maybe Russia is not, you know, taking over the whole Ukraine, if they win, hopefully it, it, it stops somehow. And, you know, it comes back to, you know, that people are really like to, to a real life, a real civil, you know, uh, discourse, but it might be that actually the, they say, all right, you know, that's going half of the country. This will be, you know, enough. Then, you know, what happens to the West? Because that's almost like, you know, we shouldn't forget, like the Ukraine is very rich in terms of agriculture, you know, just weed and all kinds of stuff. It used to be more in the West, not in the East. So, but again, like, you know, when we are looking at the, the industry of the future, it's not heavy industry, which is in the Donets which, you know, is, is in uh, Russian control right now, there's something which different. This high technology is like, you know, you know, so there are indications that actually the, there might be also a, a silver lining that, you know, just uh, at least, you know, a certain um, population in the worst, in the worst case scenario will actually have some uh, support and uh, they, they will go making a future. Yeah, and it, it could be that um, that modern technology, agricultural technology, uh, would be useful to redevelop uh, all that agriculture with the black soil of the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they will have a, a prosperity in agriculture, um, you know, as a possibility. Right, absolutely. 
Well, thank you, Manfred. Manfred Zapka, uh, a planner, an engineer, uh, who's been making better places for people to live for a long time here in Hawaii. Thank you so much for coming down, and, and thank you for thinking about this and, and helping us understand the possibilities. Well, thank you so much, Jay. It's been a really, it's always an inspiration when I tune into Think Tech. You know, you've done a really fantastic job in 20 years right now. It's amazing. So this is a real service for the for Hawaii. And I really, you know, thank you for your service there. Thank you, Manfred. We'll we'll circle back. We'll do some more of this because it's obviously a completely dynamic subject. <laughs> thank you, Manfred. Manfred okay. Zapka. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.